Good evening and thank you for inviting me to attend. It's a great privilege to be asked and um, I'm here basically to tell you about our journey against coal seam gas on the Liverpool Plains. <clears throat> um, I won't go into how good the Liverpool Plains is because it's pretty obvious, um, but one of the issues is, is it, its proximity to ports and that's, a, you know, that uh, it can be a real geographical thing, this um, extraction of gas and, and coal. Um, the, the Liverpool Plains is now completely covered by exploration licences, uh, as is most of New South Wales, and I think we've got some maps for... Um, this is the current mineral titles over New South Wales. Then the next one, that's the mineral title applications. Keep going, Tim. It gets better. Current coal titles. Keep going. Coal title applications. Current petroleum titles. Petroleum title applications. Is that the last one? Yeah, that's the last yeah. one. So, look, there's not much there for anyone to live, let alone farm or whatever. In October 2008, Santos called a public meeting at our local hall, which is Blackville, tiny little village, magnificent little hall, typical of all those towns. Um, and it was to introduce coal seam gas and their concept of exploring seismic activity, all that sort of stuff. So the locals turned up, there were probably over 90 of us. We were pretty angry, we'd been brought up on the whole coal drama and we all strongly believed in the protection of this land. Um, gas was a completely new thing. Um, we were incredibly fortunate from my point of view to have um, George Laskell of uh, the Hunter Valley Protection Group where they've been, which is magnificent as you know, wine, gr wine growing region at Broke. Uh, George has been researching it for years. I talked to him, I did a tiny bit of research and then fell upon the late Mark Atkinson's report on the Pilliga State Forest. <coughs> um, this report covered the spills that occurred in 2001 um, at the time when Eastern Star Gas was, um, oh, well, Eastern Star Gas, as you know, was chaired by Minister John Anderson, who was Deputy Prime Minister. Um, Hands, I've got this speech has gone. It's quite odd. I've cut and pasted it somewhere. <coughs> it was uh, so we had this. What I'm saying is that we had the expertise of the Broke area, and then what was happening in the Pilliga Forest. It was it was pretty disgusting. It's just a whole litany of spills, methane, migra methane migration, destruction of lag large tracts of lands. So at this meeting, initially I asked um, Santos about it, and they looked at us and said, "Oh, I've never heard of this." Well, Santos at that time had a 20% shareholding and 35% share of the tenements. So we were under no illusion that Santos was going to be terrifically transparent. <coughs> other figures, that other people asked questions about the Java mudslides, where over 30,000, the figures vary. I've heard up to 100,000 people have been displaced, infrastructure destroyed. Santos walked away owing $22 million. Um, the mudslides in Java continue, they've become a tourist attraction and most people are still uncompensated for the loss of their homes and their land. So to us, Santos came with a severe credibility problem and they clearly um, were a bit short on the lack of corporate responsibility. <clears throat> Since then, Santos has completed its seismic testing. They have drilled numerous coal, hole, coal holes, managing effectively to find the weak, the gullible, and the financially strapped who have allowed them on their lands for coal hole drilling. They have set up an office in Gunnedah, set out, send out a, a glossy quarterly update, spend a lot of money telling us what fine corporate citizens they are, and still have managed to evade important questions such as, will you frack? What will you do with the wastewater? What you, will you do with the many tonnes of waste salt that will be extracted with this waste water? As probably most of you are aware, exploration licences for coal seam gas maps have been, for coal seam gas, have been issued across the state. <coughs> the process of, of coal seam extraction requires drilling into the coal seam gas aquifer, the depths of which vary, and extracting water to release the pressure. The gas then flows to the top where it is separated from the water. The waters are extracted in, in most cases around 0.6 megalitres per day and is then put into holding or evaporation ponds. This water has a high salt content. Eastern Star gas figures talk of 13,500 milligrams per litre of salt. For a megalitre, which is the size of um, an Olympic pool, can produce 13.5 tonnes of salt. 
given that Santos has said, and I believe this to be a very conservative figure, that they will extract five gigalitres of water from a coal seam gas development on the Liverpool Plains, this would mean that 13,500 tonnes of toxic salt per development will have to be disposed of. Santos has no solution of what to do with this toxic salt. The extraction of large amounts of water, salt and gas will effectively depressurise the aquifer. It is doubtful that aquifers will recover from this sort of extraction. On Monday night, Professor Pills gave, um, was on the 7.30 report for the drying up of the Hurl Mill Lakes. Now, it, during that report, he said that coal seam gas extraction was akin to long wall mining. So we're looking at massive extraction, massive salt. As you can understand, that salt and water has been holding the land as it is for generations, uh, for, you know, ever since the world was invented. Um, <clears throat> as Senator Heffernan repeatedly asked the gas companies, how do you fix an aquifer? Can an aquifer be repaired? The gas companies have never been able to answer. They have no answer. The aquifers which underlay the Liverpool Plains are at the moment well managed. Irrigation licences in this area have been cut by as much as 70% and aquifers are recharging. However, large scale extraction by the coal seam gas companies will also draw down on the potable aquifers above, which will impact upon our, upon our surface waters. One of the great myths the coal seam gas companies say is, oh no, there's an impermeable barrier. They don't, you know, and they operate underneath the impermeable barrel, a bar a barrier. They don't account for the natural cracking, the fissures, the folding and the thrust of the earth. <coughs> um, <coughs> it is said that farmers only fight over wives and water. And I can tell you, Sandos now has one huge fight on their hands. As a nation, we are heavily dependent on our groundwater. Little is known of the interconnectivity of the aquifers. Our Great Artesian Basin and Murray-Darling Basins are really our only source of significant water, and our dependence on these ancient water systems is frightening. Destruction of these will have extraordinary repercussions on just us as a, as a state, as a people, but will change our farming practices forever. For example, the Powder Ruby Valley in Wyoming, formerly a productive cattle producing area and um, you know, associated hay production, etc., now is the kind of area where hobby farmers such as Sandra Bullock run a few horses. The underground water is not there. Uh, and the Powder River Valley has been going for about 30 to 40 years. So we're looking at a really long-term thing. We cannot, you know, no one can hope to really assess what's going to happen in 40 years' time. Above the ground, we face an extraordinary amount of infrastructure. There will be pipelines, compressor stations, holding ponds and wellheads. Wellheads can be spaced 150 to 500 metres apart. There is a process known as a fill-in, where wells can be spaced closer as the gas production slows. Of course, you have heard, all heard of the term fracking, involving the injection of many millions of litres of water, sand and chemicals into the coal seam, coal seam to release the gas. This process effectively shatters the aquifer. The force which the frack chemicals and water is pumped into the ground is believed to have caused earth tremors, tremors and triggered, triggered earthquakes up to 5.3 on the Richter scale in several areas in America. As the Liverpool Plains is adjacent to the Hunter Mukai fault line, we have good reason to be nervous. There are many documented cases of water contamination in the United States related to fracking. And just recently, the EPA in America has recognised this connection. This is after you know, 30 to 40 years. The reality is, however, that <clears throat> we have also been criticised by many people for drawing comparisons to the United States. So the reality of this is, however, that the USA has the luxury of many snow-fed rivers and the water they extract is around 850 grams per litre. So the situation is far more in seri serious in Australia with, as I said before, 13,500 milligrams per litre. The Liverpool Plains fertility is due to the amazing black self-munching soils of the plains. These soils are constantly moving and turning over. They have a unique water holding capacity, which makes it extremely difficult to work on the plains after even very small rainfall. Many farmers get very excited and think that's their day to go to town if we've got five mils of rain, because uh, you just can't do anything. <clears throat> farmers are constantly replacing poly pipelines and fences. In the early days of settlement, roads on the Liverpool Plains were built around the foothills for good reasons. If a bullock dray became bogged, it would be there for many days. Disturbance of topsoil has led to waterways and surface water 
creating major channels and erosion. Farmers, through many generations of experience, now practice techniques to avoid disturbance of the soils on the plains, techniques which have taken years to evolve. The construction of many wells and all weather ro roads will create huge erosion. It is no wonder that the farmers are justifiably angry at the thought of this short-term industry coming into areas such as the Liverpool Plains. Now, this is an example of you know, our fantastic soil. This actually happened in grassland. There's an existing natural gas pipeline about half the size of what the coal seam gas people um, <coughs> uh, uh, want to put. You know, these are the sort of pipelines that will be crossing it. Now, this happened on a grassed-in area on the side of the road. Um, it started from a very small uh, piece of erosion. 3,000 tonnes of rocks later, um, uh, $800,000, just keep going, Tim. Um, they managed to um, pick it, uh, fix it, and the last person to saw, saw it, who was a soil expert, said, well, that's not going to last long. So we're going to, just these wells, at pipelines crisscrossing is going to create its own incredible um, hassles in itself. One of the arguments constantly made by gas companies is that agriculture and gas can coexist. From this photo, you can see that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for this type of coexistence. And, you know, there's a, very few studies have been done on the impacts upon grazing cattle within, you know, close to gas wells. And a lot of evidence from the states is emerging that suggests that cows lose 30% of their fertility, that contamination issues can occur. Um, there's been... Uh, and getting to the food chain, there's been a sort of a, a whole litany of things starting to come out of America now, which I'm sure Helen's going to cover a lot better than me. The other argument, of course, is employment. The gas industry does employ a lot, but this is in the majorly in the construction stage, um, because the next thing that they say is, well, look, we won't be interrupting your gas company, so we won't be interrupting your practices, we won't be doing, we will never get in your way, because, you know, we can run this from Brisbane on a computer. So... <coughs> The state government is excited about the royalties. However, in New South Wales, which is the only state in Australia to do this, the gas industry has a five-year royalty holiday, that which increases from 1% per year. So after five years, they pay 6%, 7%, 8%, 9%, 10%. 10%. Unfortunately, <coughs> the life of a gas well is very short. Um, it is believed that the most gas comes out of a gas well in the first 18 months. So, you know, and often wells probably don't last that long. I and mean, there are plenty of wells that put down the only last a very short period of time. There is, of course, the occasional nirvana that goes on for 25 years and they all think it's wonderful. But the point I'm making is there is not a lot of money coming out of this for the state. Um, there's also other incentives for the gas industry, such as a 50% production um, cost tax, so that's um, deducted, 50% of their costs. And, um, you know, it's just incredible that New South Wales state government is so excited about it. <clears throat> Probably one of the bi biggest issues in this, that this industry is nearly entirely self-regulated. Well, it is entirely self-regulated. With only four mine inspectors in New South Wales at the time, at the moment, it is clear that the government will be relying on a lot of self-monitoring. It is ironical to think that in the 1950s, a government employee had to be present when any drilling in the Great Artesian took place for water. Such was their concern for the preservation of groundwater. Now gas companies in Queensland are drilling as fast as they can, figures suggesting that 40,000 gas wells will be drilled in Queensland alone. Spills and mishaps supposedly have to be reported by the company itself. Recently in the Pilliga, which is Australia's largest intact temperate natural woodlands, Narrabri had a large spill in July last year. At this time, Eastern Star Gas was in negotiations with Santos um, and as is subsequently happened, Sandhorse has, bought, has taken Eastern Star Gas over. <clears throat> this was a spill that was not reported. Santos, having, over, having taken over Eastern Star Gas, still didn't report it. It wasn't until a vigilant um, local spotted it and took it to the media. That same guy has been reporting spills, etc., for um, many times, and it's only since the Greens and the media have become interested that any notice has been taken of him. This spill was, they say, 10,000 litres of sump pond. Trees and vegetation is dying. The area is covered in a black tar-like substance, very similar to the spill reported in 2002 by Atkinson. It was not under... Oh, yeah. Our recent... I've been asked to speak about the blockade, and blockades are a funny thing. Our recent blockade at Spring Ridge was in response to Santos's attempt to put up pilot production in this area. 
Pilot production is actually seen as being in the exploration, in the exploration phase. <clears throat> it means um, it's construction of five or to seven wells, um, three to five to seven wells, depending on what they want to do. They have some ponds, they extract water. It's a way of measuring the gas. So for this to come under exploration phase, I mean, if you're thinking there's just a few people out making a couple of odd drill holes, it's nothing like this. And there has never been, in the history of New South Wales, of any gas extraction, that pilot production has not turned into full-scale production. So <clears throat> we sort of... <sighs> the government had taken no notice of us. Santos, who were bound by the water study, the Catchment Catchment water study, really were taking no notice of us. And so we called a blockade. And blockades are great in some ways. We had a fantastic um, response. Everybody turned up. We had over 300 visitors. It was a fantastic 21 days. But there's actually nothing worse than sitting on the side of the road with 80-year-old farmers who have worked all their lives, done, oh, shit, sorry, um, sitting in the sun like it was a, a heat wave. And these people are sitting there protecting their patch and the government has done nothing. No one is looking out for us. Anyway, <clears throat> and their wives, don't forget the wives, fabulous with the cakes and the morale and everything else. Um, <laughs> it is also um, another thing that was terribly significant, I thought, and showed our commitment to the cause was that on the second day we heard the police were coming in, the drill rigs were coming in, and um, they were coming in under police escort. <clears throat> and so we were on the phones like the night before saying, well, come on everybody, this is it. More, more people turned up. We probably had over 100 people on the second day. And that, so it shows that we are prepared to put our, life, put our reputations on the line and get arrested protecting our stuff. <clears throat> right, it also illustrates very much that Sandals simply does not have a social licence to operate in our area. Further down the track, we are coming, becoming aware of the rehabilitation issues faced with this type of extraction. <clears throat> As I previously mentioned, there are 40,000 wells in Queensland. We have no idea what's happening in New South Wales. <clears throat> when production finishes, wells are simply lopped off below ground level and the holes are cemented. Cement deteriorates and steel casings rust. The integrity of this well can never be guaranteed as the earth is constantly moving. We will leave to our children and our grandchildren a long-lasting liability as these wells will have to be constantly maintained. In the USA, it costs around 800000 to cap and fill these bores. This is a huge impost that we are putting on future generations for these multinational companies that are invading our country. So in conclusion, is this industry really worth the loss of prime food growing regions? As our governments, are our governments really strong enough and long-sighted enough to stand up to the gas industry? It appears not. There are lobbyists throughout the whole, from the industry that have graduated from New South Wales Parliament and Federal Parliament and are working actively with the energy companies. And to me, that's incredibly corrupt in its own way. <coughs> the f number of former government staffers, ministers and advisers being lured into the gas industry for huge salaries is to be... Unreal. Our universities are funded heavily by the mining and gas companies. Surely the easiest way to turn our best and br brightest to lose, turn out our best and brightest to lose independent thought. We have a huge task ahead of us to guarantee that our children and grandchildren enjoy the same access as we have had to fresh food and uncontaminated water. It is only through the strength of the people that we can bring about change and I ask you all to help us out on this and demand that our valuable food regions, food growing regions, areas of extreme conservation value such as the Pilliga, which I would like to say many, uh, many of our forefathers believe that's where our rainfall comes from, so it's not just a conservation issue, but it is also for the bioregional bio diversity. <clears throat> um, I think in closing of talking about our commitment to the land, there's one thing that my father always said to us, and I'm pretty sure Tim's father said it, but it, all our lives it was drummed into us to look after the land, for the land will look after you. So I ask you, what are we doing?